Welcome everyone to this work in progress talk presented by the Oregon Humanities Center at the University of Oregon. Uh, this is our first virtual work in progress talk and we're delighted to have you with us. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the OHC. Our work in progress talks are informal presentations given by U of, University of Oregon faculty and graduate students who are current research fellows at the Oregon Humanities Center. If you have questions for our presenter after the talk, please use the chat feature. You can access the chat feature by hovering over the bottom of the Zoom window with your cursor. The questions will be moderated by me and my co-hosts and I will ask them of our speaker. The talk is being recorded and will be available for viewing later today on the Oregon Humanities Center's website and YouTube channel. Our guest is Lindsay Mazurik, an assistant professor of history at the University of Oregon and a 2019-2020 Oregon Humanities Center faculty research fellow. A specialist in the ancient history of the Mediterranean region, her research focuses on concepts of ethnicity, religious identity, and foreignness from a material culture perspective. Lindsay's talk will focus on her book, which has just got an under contract from uh, Cambridge University Press. Congratulations again, Lindsay. And the title is Embodying Isis, Egyptian Religion and the Negotiations of Greekness in the Second Century CE, which she is working to complete during her OHC fellowship. Lindsay, thank you so much for sharing your project today and welcome. Thank you, Paul. Um, thank you for everyone for coming. Normally these talks attract about 10 to 15 people. So this is a uh, big step up, I guess, but I'm really excited to share with you what I've been working on. Um, and just, I'm really grateful to the Oregon Humanities Center for giving me this opportunity uh, to talk about my work and also to really work on finishing this book. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen with you now. I apologize since I haven't been teaching, I am not the uh, Zoom expert that many of you are now, um, but here we go, and okay. So today's talk is aimed to give you a brief overview of the book project, which explores the ways that Greeks who lived under the Roman Empire worshiped Egyptian deities. This problem, this um, project began as my doctoral dissertation back at Duke, but at its core is really a meditation on how ethnicity responds to imperialism and globalization in antiquity. I take a holistic approach to these questions and bring together evidence from documentary, literary, archeological, and art historical sources. My main project during my term as an OHC fellow is responding to reader reports and revising the book for publication. Not very glamorous work, but work that must be done. I'm going to begin my talk by walking you through a very brief history of how the cults get to Greece, and then outline the three major questions that the book addresses. Then I'll um, outline briefly how each chapter contributes to my overarching argument, that Greek devotees revised existing narratives about Isis and Greek culture in order to place Egyptian cults into the Greek deep past. This finding has significant consequences for understanding how ethnicity and its boundaries were negotiated in the Roman Empire. At the end, there will be time for Q&A and I look forward to hearing your thoughts. So what are Egyptian deities? Uh, the main ones that we see in um, Greece and Italy and other parts of the Northern Mediterranean are Isis and Serapis. So Isis is a very ancient Greek deity. She appears as early as the fourth dynasty, which is when the pyramids are constructed. In the Greek period, though, she's often conceived of as a queen goddess, as a goddess who can kind of subsume all gods, all places, all cultures under her godhead. Um, she's very universal. She's very much considered to be at the pinnacle of the, the divine hierarchy. Her husband is a god named Serapis, and Serapis is a much more interesting and much more problematic figure in many ways. He does not appear until the fourth century BCE when uh, the Greek rulers, the Ptolemies, take over uh, Egypt and begin to sort of fiddle with uh, Egyptian culture, which is a fascinating question in and of itself. Serapis is a bit of a mashup. He seems to be some combination of Zeus, of Osiris, who's the Egyptian god of the dead, as well as this um, bull god named Apis. So in Greek culture, he's often treated as a king consort god. He's definitely, um, particularly after the second century BC, uh, a little bit under Isis in the hierarchy. Um, and he's sometimes connected to the idea of the underworld. So in this statue here, he's got uh, Hades, the Greek god of the underworld, his three-headed dog Cerberus with him. 
Now, Isis and Serapis have a son. His name is Harpocrates, um, and you can see him here. He's a child god. He never grows up, and he's often depicted sort of pudgy, cute, um, and he has a very signature little uh, gesture he makes. He touches his finger to his mouth, which, of course, the CDC no longer recommends. <laughs> now, on the right, I know that many of you might be looking and, you know, only see, um, have, have kind of the the look there, which is a shame because Anubis is really the most interesting looking of the three. Um, he is the Egyptian god of mummification. And in Egyptian religion, he is a jackal or has a jackal head. Um, and the Greeks often sort of pick that up. There are not actually that many representations of Anubis, but here we can see him. He's a jackal head that's been jammed onto a body of Hermes, who is a Greek god that can go in between the, the afterlife and the, um, and the life of mortals. Um, and it really does produce some quite interesting uh, material culture. So the Egyptian gods like to be worshipped in triads, so most often you actually see Isis, Serapis, and Anubis put together and worshipped as a group. Slightly less frequently you see Isis, Serapis, and Harpocrates. So those are sort of the, the background of who these gods are. So how do the gods get from Egypt to Greece? We actually know more about this than you would expect. It seems that in the 4th century BCE there is a group of Egyptian priests we don't know if they know each other. We don't know if they were sent up there as a group or you know, sort of this propaganda project, but all those have been suggested, but there's not really any evidence to suggest why they all go roughly around the same time. But right around that 300 BCE mark, you get individual Egyptian priests sailing up to Greek port cities. Um, so this guy, for example, Uafares, he's gone up to Demetrius, which is an important port in central Greece, and he founds his own sanctuary to the Egyptian gods. Now, initially, these are very small sanctuaries, privately controlled, and they seem to primarily serve a very mixed audience that includes immigrants from all over, not just Egypt, but Syria, um, Asia Minor, et cetera, et cetera. By the end of the second century BC, so around that 100 BC time period, the ethnic makeup of these groups changes quite a bit. You start to see almost exclusively Greek people. Um, and identifying these people primarily by name does have some, some complications. It's not as easy as it sounds, but we see people who are primarily using Greek names and Greek language. Um, and also these sanctuaries start to be taken over by cities, which indicates that this, is, this cult is growing in popularity and acceptance, that cities see this as a normative part of their religious landscape. So one of the questions I almost always get asked when I talk about this is, well, who cares? This is clearly such a minor issue. Like there's clearly can't be that many of these ISIS devotees. And you'd actually be surprised. There are a lot. Uh, I don't like to give absolute numbers. My students always want them, but I find them a little bit, you know, it always requires such a house of cards to get to any absolute number. But I think this map can give you a really clear sense of just how widespread these are. So we start from our very early sanctuaries in the third and fourth centuries BCE. And then by the time that you get to about the first century B BC and CE, they're all over Greece. And by the second century CE, there's probably a sanctuary to Isis and Serapis in every major city and most minor cities of the Roman Empire. There's a sanctuary on Hadrian's Wall up in Britain. There's a sanctuary out in modern Afghanistan, obviously all over North Africa. Uh, they really are extremely widespread, which tells you that this is a really popular cult and one that really has often been treated as something that's an outlier, something that is separate from day-to-day -day life in Greece and Rome. But my work is really all about saying, this is common. This is something that lots of people are doing. Let's figure out what that means. So my book is centered on three key questions that in and of themselves sort of answer a bigger question. But I wanna kind of start off with what is that bigger question? The main question I'm trying to think out about here is, what does it mean for a Greek person who's living under the Roman Empire to worship an Egyptian deity? What are the implications of that? What are the consequences of that? And within that sort of big question, I think there are three smaller questions that my book tries to address. So the first is defining Greekness under the Roman Empire. At a first glance, this is a pretty well-trod topic. Lots and lots of scholars have looked at something called second sophistic literature, which is a body of uh, li Greek literature that's written primarily in the second and third centuries CE by a community of um, intellectuals based in Athens. Uh, this is some pretty interesting stuff, um, stuff you might have heard of, for example, Pausanias' Guide to Greece is sort of considered as part of this group. And we see many common trends in this um, 
body of literature that helps us understand how some people are thinking about Greekness under the Roman Empire. So for example, Pausanias, when he gives you his guide to Olympia, uh, which is you know that, that great sanctuary uh, where the Olympics come from, he tells you all about these great you know, 6th and 5th and 4th century BCE temples. But you would never know reading his sanctuary, reading his description, that Nero actually built all of this great, um, all these great bath complex and all of these training facilities. And that there's really actually a lot of intervention by later Roman um, dedicators. So what is Pausanias doing here? He's actually erasing the stuff that's in the present and recent past in order to really highlight the period that he thinks marks the height of Greek excellence. And that's what we call the classical period. That's the period of Plato. That's the period of uh, Pericles and the Peloponnesian War and the Parthenon, all the good peace. Um, but this period, it really becomes a key part of how many of these second sophistic authors are trying to emphasize the excellence of Greece. So this Greekness that they're creating then is retrospective and that it looks back particularly to that classical period and it's inward looking. It uses the Greek world defined rather narrowly um, to kind of create this argument for Greece as this very excellent and very important cultural phenomenon. Um, and this is often seen as a key way of responding to the rather marginal position that Greece holds in the Roman Empire in general. What's also remarkable is that there's a lot of concern about policing these cultural boundaries. Uh, in theory, now, if you are a person from Gaul, uh, we, I will give you an example, our, our dear friend Favorinus of Aralate, he comes to Athens and he learns his Plato. He learns to speak Greek really well. He becomes a really famous orator. And he starts to kind of claim that he is better at being Greek than people who are actually born in Greece because he's done the Greek actions. Um, and when you read second sophistic literature, you often see a lot of moments where someone like Favorinus gets made fun of and gets cast out. Um, his statues are torn down at particular points. Um, other intellectuals in his circles make fun of him for being for having an improper accent. So what we're seeing here is a real concern, a real constriction around who can legitimately claim that Greekness. So all of this is pretty well done. People have you know, said all these really interesting things. But one thing to keep in mind is the second sophistic is 35 men, 35 very elite, very wealthy men. And I think there were probably more than 35 men in Greece during the Roman period. And that also omits a lot of other people. So one of my goals with my book is to ask, well, what if we just say, what if we recognize this is a small subset and that there are lots of other options? What else can be opened up for us? The second question is, what happens when you take an Egyptian god and you put her in Greece? What, what changes? How do we translate that? Um, and also that question of how does religion change as it moves? Gods often have homes, they have places, they're connected to experiences of culture and time and space in very important ways. And so Isis in Greece cannot be the same as Isis in Egypt. And so what I've, 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 I've observed and I will demonstrate when I talk about the chapters in more detail is that actually there's a translation process. There's an interpretation of Isis that is specific to Greece itself. The third question is about how we conceptualize identity. Um, in the you know, rather distant past, lots of scholars have kind of treated Greekness as, well, we all know what it is. We don't need to define it. There's just Greekness. Obviously, more recently, people have uh, changed that. We now think of identity as something that we do, something that we choose, something that we can change. And in terms of this cult, what we often see is Greek devotees, like our, our friend Sosibia here, um, really identifying with Isis in very dramatic ways. So for example, this series of reliefs that I deal with in chapter five, you see all of these devotees literally dressing up like the goddess, um, which is very idiosyncratic, not something you see very often in other contexts. Um, and so in order to deal with this sense of identity as a practice, something that we do, um, something that we create, I've been working particularly with the, the work of Rogers Brubaker, who's key book, Ethnicity Without Groups, suggests that we need to think about concepts like identity as events and as things that are fragile and can break and change at any moment. So I use a group of key concepts, which I've outlined here, and I'll discuss in a little bit more detail, to frame each chapter as a way to think about the constituent processes that go into creating something like an ethnic identification. 
I just wanted to read this inscription for you because I think it's really quite fun. Um, so this is probably the most dramatic moment of this self-identification. So this is a grave inscription of a woman named Dionysia from Megalopolis, which is in central Greece, probably from the second and third century CE. So this tomb belongs to a woman who died in an amazing fashion after living a venerable life, as all would agree. If you ask her name, it is Dionysia, she who would be judged happy if all the divine favors she received were known. For from the age of 15 years old, Isis Pantocrator allowed her to be a servant and to arrange the Isaac garments. Then when she reached the age of 60, when she was called to be a temple servant in a holy manner, for a lustral bath washed her beautiful skin, and when combining her sacred locks, she arranged them with moist perfumes. And when she went to the altar, she prayed and went to the stars, revealed by all, as if she joined, left us to join the demigods in a holy way. Dionysia, farewell. So this is a really dramatic instance of someone who spent literally her whole life attending the goddess, dressing the goddess, and then in the, sort of the twilight of her life, actually dressing up as the goddess. And that uh, gives her this great achievement, which is that she gets to go uh, and be among the demigods in the stars. So the book has seven chapters. I've kind of walked you through more or less what the introduction covers. Um, and then each of the um, five body chapters deals with one of these Brubaker concepts. So the check second chapter is called Building Groupness, Isis's Devotees, and Their Communities. So what this question really, what this chapter to, looks into is this question of identity. Are Isis devotees an identity? Do they see themselves as a group? Is this some identity that is meaningful for them? Now, the answer to that is ultimately rather unsatisfactory, which is there's no way for us to ever really know. But the question that I choose to pose instead is, is there a sense of groupness? Is there an idea that we're going to create a group of Isis devotees that is bounded and orders and structures people's lives? So by looking particularly at uh, inscriptions, which are um, texts inscribed on stone that often record uh, laws or dedications or honors or membership lists, I look at all these different social and ritual creations within the cult that would order a lot of people's times and social um, identities. So for example, many ISIS uh, communities have smaller sort of fraternal organizations within them that perform very specific groups. You can think of perhaps something like the Shriners, uh, where you spend a lot of time going through the ranks to create this, and it becomes a key part of what you do with your time and, and the people that you know. Um, I also look at the ways in which families can use Isaac um, affiliation to create a sense of familial identity as well. Um, so looking particularly at a sanctuary in Northern Greece, um, a site called Dion, I look at the ways that a group of people called the Infestii use their repeated dedication in one sanctuary, not only to claim their own prominence within the city, but also as a way to really um, solidify their connection and their family's deep involvement with Isiac cults. The third chapter is called Viewing Theology. Um, and this chapter thinks about, okay, so if we conceptualize ISIS in particular ways, how does that help, how does that change the way that we actually look at the world around us? And that chapter focuses on a group of texts that are called Isaac Eritologies. So an Eritology is a hymn or a poem that is usually performed as part of a rite, and it lays out who ISIS is. I was raised Catholic and I often compare these to the Nicene Creed. They explain who the God is, how the God relates to everybody else, and what is it that we're supposed to think about this God. So this is one that we see actually in copies all over Greece. Uh, it's originally the best and fullest um, text of it comes from Chime in Asia Minor. So it says, I am Isis, the mistress of every land, and I was taught by Hermes, and with Hermes I devised letters, both the sacred hieroglyphs and the demotic, that all things might not be written with the same letters. I gave and ordained laws for men, which no one is able to change. I am the eldest daughter of Cronus. I am wife and sister of King Osiris. I am she who finds fruit for all men. I am the mother of King Horus. I am she that rises in the dog star. I am she that is called goddess by women. For me, the city of Bubastis is built. Now, if uh, you're not used to reading these, it can look like a pretty boring laundry list, but they're actually making some really interesting and complicated claims here. So Isis is the mistress of every land, called goddess by women, which indicates that she actually has control over all of these lands, that she's universal in a really important way, um, in ways that are not typical for most gods and goddesses at this point. 
She's also occupying sort of niches in the Greek religious ecosystem that belong and are very closely assigned to particular deities. So for example, she's inventing writing and laws, both of which tend, writing tends to be associated with Hermes and laws tend to be associated with Athena. She's finding fruit for men, which is a job of Demeter. Um, she's also a daughter of Cronus. And if you know your Greek mythology, Cronus is the father of the, all of the Olympian deities. So now she's basically the sister of Zeus. She's getting put right into that pantheon. But there's also a lot of attempt to kind of keep her grounded in the Egyptian world as well. She's still married to Osiris. She's still the mother of Horus. Um, she's connected with that dog star, which is um, tend the rising of the dog star tends to mark the inundation, the annual flooding of the Nile. Um, and she's also sort of the patroness of Bubastis. So she's kind of existing in between these two lands, but also universally across lands. So she really does become a global goddess par excellence. So now that we've established that this is sort of this theology of Isis, this is what people believe, we wanted, I wanted to move more towards the material culture side. Um, I'm an art historian by training, so that was my real interest. So in chapter four, I look at the ways in which we visualize Isis and stones. So what are the images we create of Isis now that we know that she, this is how we're conceptualizing her? So going back to those four statues, what I found is actually there's a real difference in how Isis is represented in Greece as opposed to in other parts of the Mediterranean. Many of my colleagues have looked at Italy in particular, and they noted that there's a lot of tendency to use imported stones and imported objects in um, Egyptian sanctuaries. This sort of sense of we're going to bring an object over and that's how we're going to represent the goddess. In Greece, that doesn't seem to happen. For whatever reason, they are less interested in using imported uh, objects. Instead, what they prefer to do is they prefer to represent Egyptian deities in Greek styles and Greek materials. And that has two sort of complementary but different implications. Uh, the Greek styles renders these gods very familiar and does some of the similar work of putting them in sort of the Greek artistic canon as much as they were put in the Greek religious canon by the text. The materiality also really grounds them in Greece in particular. During the Roman Empire, there's almost a language of stones. Uh, people will import stones from all over the empire and put them together as a way to assert global control. But these are almost insistently made with white marbles and white marbles are often associated not only with Greece, but again, that classical past that we discussed at the beginning, we're talking about Greekness. So the materiality of these uh, sculptures and their styles come together to create a version of Isis and Serapis that is not only made familiar, but also really grounded in that Greek physical landscape. From there, we turn into the question of self-fashioning. So how do Isis devotees who see the gods in this particular way, who um, have this particular textual understanding of what these gods are, how do they represent themselves as devotees? So the particular group of material I've chosen to look at here is a group of um, funerary reliefs from Roman Athens that depict women in the dress of Isis. There are actually quite a lot of these. There's about 111 which is about one sixth of all of the funerary reliefs we have from Athens from this period. So here we can again see that women are dressing up as Isis, but what's remarkable is actually men aren't. Uh, there's only about three or four of these reliefs that depict a man in dressed up in an Isaiah costume. And I think they're actually all just really bad um, sort of test cases, people trying it out and deciding it didn't work. Uh, I have one in my, um, slide, my slide deck if someone really wants to look at a really ugly statue. But these, um, these reliefs really create this gender dichotomy of women as Isis devotee and men as you know, normative parts of the Greek culture. So this chapter is also a place where I get on my high horse about uh, the ways that we think about Greece as a Roman province. Oftentimes Greece doesn't get treated as part of this big provincial discussion. And so it, it's not really analyzed in a colonial or post-colonial way. I use these reliefs to think about, to suggest that actually what's going on here is a common pattern that we see all throughout the empire of using gendered forms of difference to negotiate the tension between local or um, other sorts of smaller minority identities and these broader Mediterranean wide uh, Roman identities. Uh, so these uh, reliefs allow people to claim that they are not only important members of the Isi community, but that they are also important members of Roman Athenian society at large. So we're seeing a real negotiation of a colonial situation through this portraiture. 
The final chapter looks at this idea of place. Where does one worship an, Isis, an Egyptian deity? And I look particularly at sanctuaries to the Egyptian gods. Uh, I focus particularly on this one here at Dion, as well as one at Marathon that I've discussed in other um, publications. What I find is that many of these sanctuaries include either natural features, as you see here with Dion. Um, the sanctuary obviously wouldn't have been fully flooded at the time, but it's clear that it actually would have been filled with water in many other ways. Or they actually include Egyptian architectural features, um, whether it's pyramids or pylons that look like Egyptian temples or sphinxes. They create a world in which you can imagine that you are entering Egypt as you enter the sanctuary. This gets tied up into these ideas of miniaturization that uh, many of my scholarly colleagues who've looked at, for example, wall paintings from Pompeii, note that many of these visual representations of Egypt that occur in Rome, in Pompeii, and here in Greece, I argue, are all about miniaturizing far off places to create a sense of control and a sense of access that any Greek person can build and create their own Nile and also control it in a way and control where it is, control when it happens and where. And this is a part of creating and claiming a sense of centrality and control for Greek devotees as they navigate the Roman Empire. So in sum, what can we say about Isaiah cults in Roman Greece? These are sort of the main takeaways of my argument here, which is that Greek devotees are using texts and objects to redefine Isis as a deity and to place her very firmly into Greek myth history. And it's important to know the difference in time here. They're not placing her into that classical period. They're actually pushing her much further back into the very beginnings of Greek mythology, into the time of Homer. Greek devotees visualize Isis in Greek styles and materials in ways that render her familiar. We're lessening her foreignness and trying to negotiate her place in a Greek pantheon. Greek devotees promote and engage in rituals in which they embody Isis and other Egyptian deities. And they're finding ways in which they can kind of create these important ontological slippages between themselves, the gods, and the objects that mediate those, particularly divine statues. And I think that it's really important to note that the, the final conclusion is that this is all happening in a very key concept, context, the Roman Empire. Isaac cult moves as quickly as it does, as easily as it does, because Roman imperialism has made it possible to do so. Because the, inten the intensifying connections, the intensifying trade, the intensifying um, cultural exchanges make it possible and profitable to create something like a Greek version of ISIS. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Why don't I begin? Uh, feel free, everyone, to... Uh, uh, send us questions uh, via the chat function and I will communicate them. But since there are none yet and I'll, I'll begin, you just mentioned the importance of the context of Roman colonialism uh, here. And you, you, you spoke about that importance in terms of the kind of um, circuits or uh, ways in which information and cultural materials could be uh, transported across the Roman empire. I'm also interested in whether the ISIS cults in Greece had some sort of anti-colonial component to them. Was there some way in which identifying with an Egyptian would be a way of um, demonstrating a kind of resistance to Roman imperial uh, control? It's funny because the very first uh, big conference paper I gave uh, was a panel on the archaeology of resistance. And I think somebody picked on me because they could tell I was a you know, new grad student. I got up and said, isn't the concept of resistance completely intellectually bankrupt? And I'm like, well, I organized this panel, so I don't think so. <laughs> but um, I think it's very difficult to really specifically attach this to a resistance, in part because we're not exactly clear on how you would resist. The, there are very few sort of small historical references um, there's a reference in, I think it's Plutarch's life of Mark Antony of these Athenians. There's a statue of Athena and they throw blood on it and they turn it away because they're mad about some, some taxes that Augustus has put upon them. Um, so the question kind of then becomes like, how would these people conceptualize resistance? And I think what we see, what's easier for us to describe is people negotiating situations in which they can preserve or emphasize or highlight some aspect of previous forms of their culture um, 
while also engaging with sort of these, what we might think of as a more standardized uh, Mediterranean wide Roman culture. But I, th I don't know that I would go so far as to say this is resistance, but I think that there is an element in which there's a sense that this is part of a Greek response to marginalization in the empire. And this is a part, one of my key argument is that this is actually an attempt for Greek people to claim their own centrality and importance within the Roman uh, cultural hierarchy to say that, you know, Greekness really is the prism through which all other cultural exchanges and all other cultural meaning is created. So uh, here's a related question. To what extent were there Greek borrowings from Egyptian religion before the onset of the Roman Empire? And if there were, how were they different or similar? There are a lot. Um, so one thing that is uh, very apparent as soon as you start to ask the question of when does globalization happen, um, it, you can find instances of it very early. Um, so already in the late Bronze Age, so that's sort of the new kingdom in Egypt, and then we're thinking about Mycenae and uh, the Minoan Crete, we can see that actually a lot of these people are going back and forth, um, that there are, you know, Egyptian painters and, and going, you know, north and the Egyptian, there's also some hypotheses that Egyptian pharaohs actually visit Bronze Age citadels, um, that Greek painters are going and painting uh, palaces down um, in Egypt as well. So it's important to really recognize that, that very early and very deep contact um, and exchange between the two. Um, in terms of religious exchange, probably the first, the easiest first point the thing to point to is uh, Herodotus' Histories, which is written in the fifth century BCE. Herodotus is a Greek historian, and I think this is debated, but I think he goes to Egypt and he writes probably one of the first ethnographies of Egyptian culture. And already there, he's saying, oh, we have, you know, Isis, and she's pretty much the same as Demeter. Um, so you can already see these equivalences happening very, very early on. Um, and that Serapis is very clearly a, a moment where we can say that somebody is kind of bringing together this mishmash of of Greek religious ideas, Greek culture, Egyptian religious ideas, and Egyptian culture to create something brand new. Um, and so I think that it's more profitable to think about this as a very deep, constant dialectic between the two, the two cultures and the two religious traditions. Great. So uh, next one. Um, you alluded to the problem of identifying ethnicity by Greek names. Uh, the question is about uh, is uh, the the questioner is asking thinking about Jewish high priests with names like Jason mm -hmm. and Menelaus in the same time period. Um, although the books of the Maccabees call them Hellenized, is that the same thing as being Greek? You know, I'm not the best person to answer that question. Actually, my my colleague uh, Kevin, I think I forget. I want to say his name. His last name is also, but I'm totally forgetting his last name. I. Uh, up at Oregon State is actually writing a book on that exact question. Um, so I will say, you know, read his book. He, he knows more about that than I do. Um, but in terms of the, the problem is uh, of identifying Egyptians, we know that people code switch much in the same way today. Um, many of our students will, you know, particularly international students will adopt an English name when they come because they'd rather just, it's easier, simpler. Um, so, you know, you'll teach a lot of uh, Eunice's or Sarah's who have completely different names that they just assume you won't be able to pronounce. And most of the time they're hundred percent right. Um, so I think that you actually see this uh, in the documentary evidence from particularly Hellenistic and Rome in Egypt very frequently. You'll see somebody who clearly has to be the same as somebody else and they'll be like Apollonius in one text and then they'll have, um, you know, Horemheb in the other text. And you can see that they actually have different names for different situations. Um, and even within the Egyptian cults that I have a really interesting base I'm working with up in Thessaloniki, where a guy is, he's, he's Roman, he's got a, a Latin name. And he, then he also says, and my nickname, Epicalumenos, um, is Demetrios. So people are using multiple names all of the time, particularly people who, trans, who move across cultural boundaries. So that makes it very hard uh, to determine if someone named Apollonios is from Egypt, if they're an ethnic, what we would call an ethnic Egyptian, um, if they're just an average Greek guy born, you know, in Demetrius. There's a lot of, you know, big open-ended questions that we probably will never be able to answer. Okay, so um, here's a next one. Uh, I will probably mispronounce one of these words, but I'll give it a try. Are the Greek sanctuaries like aditums in Greek temples, or were they more open? Also, do we know anything about the rituals or liturgies themselves? And would you say what an aditum is? So an adjoin is um, is a part of the sanctuary that you don't you can't go into um, because it's thought to be sacred. Um, it's like the place where the only the god can can be. 
the answer to that is actually probably not. Uh, the only place where I can really give you a firm answer is again, going back to that sanctuary at Dion. Um, and one of the things, I'll actually share my screen really quickly because it, it's a little easier to see um, that way. Uh, where'd it go? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so if you look very far in the background here, um, you can kind of see all, there's some stuff on, this is the temple here, you can see there's some stuff on the, the, the steps. And what actually those seem to be are commemorations of some sort of divine encounter, whether it's an epiphanic encounter or a dream encounter, we're not exactly sure. Um, but it seems that people would actually encounter those as they go up. Now, it's probably not as accessible as say a modern you know, church is today where you can kind of walk in and walk out whenever you want. You probably can only enter at specifically ritually um, delineated times. Uh, and it's clear that certain priests are allowed to enter much more often than others. Um, but it does seem like it, there's not really a full sense of the abiton in the same way that you would see in other Greek sanctuaries. Now, in terms of the rituals, this is one of those things that's also very difficult to say. Um, we can identify two major festivals on the calendar. So the one, there's one in the spring called the, the Navigidium Isidis, which is the, the sailing of Isis. There's a procession. People bring some object, usually a, a small statue of one of the gods probably Isis, you put her on a boat and you push the boat out into the sea. Um, it's supposed to mark the beginning of the sailing season and also call upon Isis to protect the sailors. Um, seafaring is a very dangerous business. There's also a festival in November called the Isaiah. Um, so one of the myths attached to Isis in uh, Egyptian, particularly once you start getting into the New Kingdom and late period, uh, particularly in the Ptolemaic period um, religion. Isis, um, you know, Osiris is killed by Seth and Seth chops up Osiris into a bunch of little pieces and sprinkles those pieces all throughout Greece and in some cases the Mediterranean and Isis has to wander the earth finding all the pieces of Osiris and when she finishes she sews them back together with the help of Anubis to create a mummy that's the first mummy um, and then somehow she and the mummy um, copulate and that is where Horus is born. So there's a, um, a, in November, there's a ritual in which people dress up as the different deities, the different characters, and they act that out. Um, there's also a lot of cons discussion of um, initiation that's um, brought up in Apuleius' as metamorphoses. Um, there is one of those things, if you're at an academic conference and you want a bunch of people to fist fight each other, you start, you know, bringing up whether you can use that as a, a reliable source. I think you can, um, and that seems to indicate that there are ritual actions that bring people into closer connection with the cult, and that's part of what I discussed in chapter two. So the next question is from your colleague, Annalise Heinz from the history department. She'd love to hear more about the gender dynamics of women embodying or dressing as ISIS and men not. Mm -hmm. More about why you, int uh, you introduced about what you introduced regarding possible social meanings of those roles in the context of ethnicity and colonialism. A few smaller questions are, were cults generally understood as male or female? Were men also devotees, but even though they didn't dress as ISIS? Yeah. So uh, this is, a, for me, one of the most interesting parts of, of the whole project. We know from the inscriptions, those, those texts that indicate you know, dedications and laws and whatnot, that actually men participate in equal, if not more numbers. And they actually, in almost every case, hold more important positions within the cult. They get to be the high priest. They get to be you know, the, the guy holding the special ritual object. Uh, women actually hold very few priestess priesthoods. Um, and actually, if you Google this or just tap it into the library, uh, website, you would probably think that this is a women's cult because literally the search algorithms pull up three books that say women in the cult of ISIS. Um, and so that actually becomes, I think, part of a, a logical fallacy in some way. We've been betrayed by our library algorithms. Hmm. So part of what I've, I was really interested in with these is there's, they seem so idiosyncratic. They seem weird. And Oftentimes, uh, ancient culture is very repetitive. They don't really, originality is not a virtue or a value. So when something is weird, that usually means that we don't really understand what's happening with it. So in that, um, that chapter, I in particular looked at funerary portraits from elsewhere in the empire. And I found that women 
in many of these cases, were wearing what we call local garments or folk garments. So they're dressing in the ways that their you know, previous cultures would have dressed. Um, although much like modern folk culture, these, these are kind of these fictions, probably fictions that are sort of a bit sort of a cultural construct anyways. Um, whereas men are almost always wearing these you know, Greek, either Greek outfits or Roman outfits, the toga, the military costume. And so what I saw is that, you know, in all these other contexts, people have said, okay, well, this is an agricultural negotiation. This is a way in which uh, people are sort of navigating that sense where they want to keep their local importance, their local status, but also claim relevance and importance on this Mediterranean-wide, empire-wide scale. Um, and I suggested that we actually consider these Isaac release as part of this tradition, as part of this dialogue, um, and that it's just really a local version of this. You know, it, Greek devotees can't just use Greek clothing to make these claims because everyone's using Greek clothing to make these claims. So these ISIS devotees are using the Isaac costume, which is really heavily marked with these ideas of difference um, to kind of make similar claims as other provincial peoples. So let me ask you uh, Abigail Fine's question now because it's related to the question of clothing. Uh, Abigail is a uh, assistant professor in the School of Music and Dance. She's asking, um, she's particularly intrigued by the chapter on embodying ISIS through clothing. Mm -hmm. Know how long these clothes were worn? Was it for shorter durations during specific rituals or for longer periods, even years, as suggested by the grave inscription? Were those who wore these clothes for longer durations thought to acquire more powers associated with the deity? And did they act as intermediaries? So that that's another really great question. And uh, it's one I had to think quite, a, quite heavily about it because of course, textiles don't survive, so we don't really know. But there are a couple sort of indications that there are some people who wear them all of the time. Most people would wear them during uh, festivals or particular rites, and it's not necessarily something that the majority of ISIS devotees would get to wear. Um, so there's a, actually a really great little passage in Suetonius when the Emperor Vespasian is um, being hunted by his political adversaries, he gets hidden, he gets sort of hidden in somebody's house. And the way they sneak him out of Rome is they actually dress him up as an Egyptian priest and put him in a procession. And so he's able to sneak out of Rome that way. Now, obviously that, that story only works if the premise is that some people are wearing these clothes all over the place every day. But there's, it's also really interesting to note that those reliefs only happen in one place. They only really happen in Athens. And they are, you know, it's still only about one sixth of the corpus. So that means that five sixths of the corpus is not wearing any of these clothing. So my hypothesis is actually that you only get to wear the costume sort of on a more regular basis if you attain a certain level of cult uh, membership, which is sort of this reaching that full initiate stage. Um, so that indicates then that the the clothes are more of a of an internal status claim that you can claim like I am this level in the hierarchy rather than necessarily the clothes themselves conferring the, the, the power and the sacredness. So the next question uh, is from Michael Najjar, who's a professor of theater arts at U of O. And, uh, his question, uh, uh, um, not surprisingly, is about theater. Uh, is it possible for you to discuss the Greek and Egyptian influences on Roman theater or Egyptian influences on Greek theater? Or is that something that's beyond your uh, range of expertise? That is, I'm afraid, very, very far beyond my range of expertise. But I will say that it's clear that there's a lot of performative aspects of this cult. There's almost a performative strangeness to it. So we have a few artistic depictions of these processions, um, and we also have literary descriptions of them. And it's clear that there's a lot of emphasis placed on creating strange types of music. Uh, so in particular, people um, waving these little rattles, which are what the women in those um, funerary release they're holding, they're holding this little rattle um, and singing in ways that are, you know, thought to be Egyptian and thought therefore would seem strange to Greek, the Greek or Roman ear. Obviously the dress is strange. Um, and then marching around the city is thought is supposed to be sort of like performing this strangeness. Um, there's also a really close connection with many of the rituals and sort of this idea of watching. And so many of the sanctuaries have what we would call sort of um, observer space. They don't do like risers or bleachers um, the way that we do, but they actually, people would watch a lot of these things happening, both within the cult itself and uh, within the city itself. Uh, so the next question is from Matthew. And Matthew wants to know, um, some of these pilgrim 
drawing festivals in Egypt are really substantially ahead of the Hellenistic period, of course. There are presumably Greeks at some of these festivals, not least in the West Delta. So to what extent do you think that, for example, the priests of sanctuaries of Hera or Aphrodite are playing those code switching games early on? And is this a direct lineage of that or something entirely new? It's always hard to draw a direct lineage from from something that's happening, you know, in the the first or second century CE all the way back to um, you know, something that's happening now, Kratos, for example, uh, the, the Greek colony where a lot, there seemed to be a lot of you know, connection as early as the, you know, fifth century BCE. Um, one, a couple of my colleagues who've worked on demotic t- hymns uh, have noted there's actually a re- lot of overlap between the Greek hymns that I talked about and Egyptian hymns that appear only slightly earlier, but also continue in use uh, throughout the Ptolemaic and Roman periods. So I think that there really is a lot of connection and it's hard to say whether, um, I don't know if you were describing uh, Greek priests in Egypt themselves or you know, these Greek priests that are based in Greece and doing part of sort of the more normative um, civic Greek religion or um, up there. But I, I think it's, it's, in, it's clear that there is a lot of discussion and dialogue uh, about hierarchies and organizations of cultures um, in Egypt um, that Eric Hornung has obviously worked in great length upon. And so I think that there's a really, I think we should always assume that this is this kind of uh, religious practice is coming out of a very long dialogue that's neither, that we can't say is easily Greek or Egyptian, but it's some sort of connection of the two. Uh, so the last question that we have, and I would urge people who are still interested in asking questions to to send them along. This one is from Roy Chen, who's a uh, um, prof in East Asian languages and literatures here at the University of Oregon. What notions or paradigms from post-colonial studies have been most useful in your project? And have you identified significant differences between thinking about post-colonialism in the 20th century and in the ancient world? Um, I think that there's been a lot that, you know, I, I want to just get out and say that I'm, I didn't invent this. There's been a long um, tradition, probably over the last 30 years, to bring what we might call sort of the classics of post-colonial studies into discussions. So we're talking, you know, Spivak, we're talking uh, James C. Scott's um, work on uh, Southeast Asia has been really important to our discussions. Um, those are kind of the the the, the foundations. Uh, Edward Said's daughter actually became a classicist, so she she was instrumental in in um, bringing her father's ideas into the discussion here. Um, I think that what the most fundamental aspect of it is just the general premise that we aren't going to ask questions necessarily about how Roman institutions and power were implemented, but ask questions about the response and the and really granting people those agencies. Um, that's been the sort of the keyest, the most key part of how that's affected. Uh, the study of Roman material culture and Roman history, most most importantly. The parts that I find um, really most useful have been thinking through these concepts of um, deterritorialization from, from Deleuze that has been obviously for, for my, my discussions of the, the sanctuaries in particular, that deterritorialization has been a really key part of what I'm thinking through, um, as well as these ideas of um, understanding um, sort of this response and, and the idea of resistance that you brought up, it, it kind of exists in the background of a lot of what I'm talking about. Um, so those have been, I think, the sort of the bedrocks of what I'm trying to do and what I and how I see myself in dialogue, not only with the people in my own discipline, but hopefully a little bit beyond that as well. Uh, do we have any other questions? I guess I'll ask one uh, and just, uh, wait, one just came in. Uh, apropos of resistant works, might you have thoughts on the Vita of Aesop as an Egyptian work that resists Roman and Greek imperialism? I'm afraid I don't really have much to say on that particular topic. Um, I mean, I think there are a lot of really interesting and useful um, texts that do sort of resist this this linear interpretation, and that's part of some of my earlier work on that, particularly that Dion and, and Marathon Sanctuary has been, is that we often try to put things in one of these two categories, but it's very hard to do that in practice because what you end up doing is sort of forcing something that exists, at, you know, 
without these these strong divisions into what we've actually created is I think scholarly divisions. Uh, I think people tend to specialize very heavily, and so uh, you know you get trained as a Romanist, you get trained as a Hellenist, um, and it's you know people don't feel confident in their ability to go between or beyond those two dichotomies, and so. I think that's actually part of the reason why, in fact, this this topic was available to me when I was casting about for a dissertation topic. It's I think because people didn't feel like they could grapple with it because it didn't fit. It doesn't fit neatly into a box, um, and so that's been a challenge. In that you know I do have to master a lot of different bodies of literature, and there's always something I'm finding that I, I missed. Um, but there's also I think that that's probably the most interesting part is getting to push on. Those um, those disciplinary boxes and, and point out that they they serve us a lot better than they serve the material. Mm -hmm. oh, fascinating. Um, since you've just raised that last point, um, can you say a little bit more? That I, I you know I'm the director of the Humanities Center, so I'm often when I'm speaking with scholars in a kind of public context, I ask them to to say a little bit about the 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 so what of what they do in the broadest terms. Then you can do that. So we're always needing to justify the importance of uh, research in the humanities. And uh, one of the things that comes up when you're trying to make that, that claim is this material, it's so specialized, it's so obscure, why should I be interested? Can you say a little bit more about the, the larger significance of what you do? I think that, I mean, there's, I think a really important thing here in, in figuring out the ways that we, we study and talk about uh, ancient empires in particular, because it's so often about sort of this center periphery model. It's about the, you know, Rome and this place um, and Rome and this other place and sort of almost like these spokes on a wheel is sort of this model that we've often studied the Roman empire with. And there's been talk about thinking about the ways in which the different provinces interact with each other. But I think this um, case study really offers us a great example to think about empires don't just connect all these different places back to the capital, they connect each other. And that produces these really interesting and really um, novel forms of culture and religion um, that can be really influential in terms of what happens next. Um, there's often been a, in, in early his studies of history religion attempt to sort of connect this rise of Isaiah cults with a you know the rise of uh, Christianity. I don't know. Again, I don't like drawing direct lines, but I think it does create sort of a next step in the ways that religion is practiced and conceived um, in the Mediterranean world. I also think that this this case study really shows us um, the ways in which uh, people are creating communities and new ways of thinking of themselves that are constantly changing and constantly responding to what's going on. I mean, this, this identity that I've hypothesized exists in my book, I think it really only lasts maybe 300 years, which seems actually like a pretty long time. Uh, but in retrospect, it's, it probably even has, and this is something I deal with in the conclusion, I think it actually probably has even smaller, more minute textures that I'm not really able to get at. Um, and somebody I'm hoping, you know, some some grad student down the line will, will take me up on the challenge to uh, to get at those micro textures and to really nuance and understand just how how much we live in very local worlds. And I think we are all feeling that right now. Well, that's a wonderful uh, way to wrap up this uh, fascinating work in progress talk. Um, thank you so much, uh, Lindsay, for sharing your work with us. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for Lindsay Mazurik's work in Progress Talk. If you'd like more information about upcoming online events sponsored by the Oregon Humanities Center, and there will be a number of them, and or if you'd like to contribute to supporting our faculty and graduate student research programs so that you can we can keep providing this kind of fascinating uh, uh, humanities research, go to our website, that's ohc.uoregon.edu. Thanks again for joining us and have a great day.